Is this working? Yeah. Yes. I turned on the power. <laughs> It is my pleasant duty to stand here in place of uh, my colleague, uh, the poet C.S. Giscom, Cecil Giscom, who hosts uh, the, the fall Holloway poetry readings here at UC Berkeley. But he himself is giving a reading of his own through a quirk of scheduling um, over which he basically had no control. Um, he sends his greetings, especially to Renee and to Nicole, um, and, uh, and his apologies for not being here. Um, and I get being glad to stand here in his place. Um, welcome to all of you. Uh, formal introductions to the two poets will be given not by me, but to Nicole's reading, uh, her work will be introduced by Michelle Chung. And then after Mich uh, Nicole reads, uh, Dylan Furcall will give an introduction to Renee Gladman. Um, Nicole comes to us from about 200 yards <laughs> southwest um, <laughs> in Dwinnell Hall, one of the more mysterious buildings on the UC Berkeley campus. Um, and Renee Gladman comes from us comes to us from uh, considerably farther away, which is the east coast of the United States. So even farther from the smoke and flames that are to the north of us. Um, I want to remind you before tonight's event starts of the other two poetry readings that will be happening as part of this series uh, this fall. Um, on Wednesday, November 8, again in this room, again at, at 6.30, the Holland Mary series will present a reading by Farid Matuk, who will come to us from the University of Arizona Department of English and Poetry Center. And he will be reading with Jessica Blazer, um, who will come to us from elsewhere in Weaver Hall. Um, <laughs> and that earlier that day, on November 8 at 4 p.m., uh, and I don't know what room, but you could figure that out, Farid Matuk will be giving a lecture in the Mixed Blood series, which Cecil Giscom uh, directs. Uh, and then on Friday, November 17, again in this room, same time, uh, there will be a performance by the trio of poets, uh, Ronaldo B. Wilson, Don Lundy Martin, and Duriel E. Harris, who joined together um, to be the Black Tooth Collective. And they will do a poetry performance work. Uh, a premiere of a work that they are going to be in Berkeley um, for a week in advance uh, creating kind of site-specific response to Berkeley on the week of November 17. Um, so we invite you to come to that too. Uh, both of those events would be powerful uh, and exciting. Uh, Renee Gladman's reading here tonight is made possible in part by the fact that she is participating in um, and being a focus of considerable amounts of attention at a conference that begins officially on this Friday at 9 a.m. in this room, where I hope once again stand up here or somewhere like it um, and say welcome. Um, the conference um, has been organized by, uh, by Daniel Benjamin, um, who is a member of the graduate students, PhD students, and advanced PhD student in the English department here at Berkeley. And his colleague, Eric Stephen, who is a PhD student at the University of Santa Cruz. Uh, I and my colleague, Chris Chen, from UC Santa Cruz are sort of in the background of organizing this. Um, we're the faculty that adds clout to messages asking for room reservations, things like that. <laughs> um, and the, uh, the conference will have panel discussions. There's a, a program that looks like this. There's a whole pile of them on the table right here. So before you leave tonight, if you have any thoughts that you might want to come, you can pick uh, up a, a program. Uh, the events are free, open to the public. There are uh, three panel events going on simultaneously. 
all day Friday um, and much of Saturday. Um, there are two plenary presentations around little afternoon in this room on both of those days. There are marathon poetry readings once in this room, once at the Omni in Oakland. Um, there's a Poets Theater production on Saturday from 4.45 to around 7 at the BAM PFA. Uh, and uh, there's screening of films at the Roxy Theater in San Francisco, uh, along with a, a flurry of other uh, profoundly non-academic events. Um, all of that's listed in the program. And I think that's all, except that I want to call your attention to the books um, by Renee Gladman that are uh, here, thanks to Mo's books. Um, they're there for you to, to take a look at. Um, and perhaps, if you want to do more than look, you actually want to read. Uh, I've read both <laughs> the books. They're really, really good. Um, then you should buy one of each, and maybe <laughs> Renee will be happy to sign them. All right, please, Michelle, could you take over for me? <coughs> Nicole Trigg wrestles with reality in iterations. A single cut into its surface is never enough. And although the fact of embodiment is never in question, its promptings are met with equal force by the longings within a body to spill out of itself. In skins and scanned and in skinned. The body considers the conditions of its own existence in one utterance, then another, as though similar sounding sound waves escape them, escaping the body might settle the paradox. Form is again interrupted by inviting chance, as in the cutting of a deck of cards. In Wake Early Modern, she writes, again the ten of swords bleed out onto the ground again, start another time. The celestial body she had been contemplating cut into her reality via the conduit of cards, its hard edges super invested with other energies. And one can intuit that it's this ability to pull again, to awaken to that moment of charged expectancy again and again that is the real draw. In this sense, the poems are marks of resilience and the health to heal. Nicole is the author of two chapbooks, Slats and Double Cup. Along with being a poet, she is in the Italian Studies doctoral program where she studies feminist theory and philosophy in Italy in the 1970s. She is interested in experimental and intergenre writing and art writing in particular. In her work as a translator, she is currently translating the writings of Emilia Rosselli and Carla Lanzi. Please join me in welcoming the call. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was so beautiful. <laughs> crazy honor to be reading with Renee Gladman. Um, you've been a, really important to me as a reader and a writer. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, I'm just also really happy to be reading for all of you tonight. Um, so um, I'm going to read some really old things. I'm going to try that. And then I'm going to read some really new, <laughs> new things. Um, OK. Um, this is um, some an excerpt from a, like a sort of short prose piece that, um, okay. um, it's called, okay. oh, maybe, okay. does anyone, do you think that, uh, <laughs> 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 so maybe I should just, Okay. 
Um, is this is this loud enough? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> this is from this piece called On Form. The victim had a degree in comparative literature and felt blessed and cursed in equal measure. There were so many things that interested her, and it was wonderful to draw lines between them. When she started writing poetry, uh, <laughs> when she started writing poetry, the sensibility persisted. If the poems operated at all, it was by diagramming relationships. I don't want to hold on to this. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, okay. Maybe. Okay. I'll just have a look at this. Does anyone know things about microphones? <laughs> had a degree in comparative literature and felt blessed and cursed in equal measure. There were so many things that interested her and it was wonderful to draw lines between them. When she started writing poetry, the sensibility persisted. If the poems operated at all, it was by diagramming relationships. Day by day after the accident, the body told its story. She was able to make out the figure of the second man in the new silhouette. She recalled there was a first man <clears throat> whom she cleared to the left only to be met by a second man. Afterward, when he gave her his hand to hold, he meant, I'm sorry, goodbye, but she wanted to remember. She arranged for an artist to make a three-quarter view contour drawing of her head from behind. The lower right half of her face showed the boldest impression. Consider a clock face large enough to pull over the head laced with spokes and opened in a plane perpendicular to the spine as a giant collar. Consider the tip of the nose like a hand registering 12 o'clock. The face was impacted at 1.30, so its rigid components leaned left and back, while the flesh swelled right and forward. Peeling open the lower lip revealed a tear below the gum line, spanning the right half of the jaw. The septum of the nose bowed from right to left, leaving lopsided nostril shapes. The idea that there are no new ideas was not new to her, nor was it interesting. She was concerned with form first, and not a fountain of knowledge. Indeed, form is also thought of, as in idealized, but it is the implementation of the thought, the thought in action, that she admired and felt implicated in. From a book review on Camille Roy's author page, I learned that in Sherwood Forest, Roy writes in the voice of character Camille, I read somewhere that dialogue is tongues in a nest, addressing Lucy, who replies, that's my feeling. It's invented and pleasurable and underage. I spent the day trying to hold the, tree, the three qualifiers in my mind. I had to return to the website several times. It made terrific sense, and the image was so awkward and explicit at the same time that it seemed apt on many levels. Is critical writing then the still life painting of the tongues? How neatly it eats itself with grammatical terms like contrarywise and as versus at the paragraph breaks. How tidily the thought switches back. M says the form is sexual, each new paragraph pushing into its precedent. I drew one card at a time, the Ten of Swords followed by the Ace of Cups. I might have stopped at the Ten of Swords had it not been apparent that the card did not represent an answer to my romantic question and motive for the reading, but the foundation and context for that question. As such, its seemliness was absolute. I was laid out on a rock, my back arched to match the curve of the stone beneath a spray of hovering spears pointed at my neck and shoulders. For the first 24 hours after surgery, I didn't move my neck at all, so when I finally did, the tendons spasmed and stuck out on both sides. 
Mostly I associate mountaintops with <coughs> able bodies, but the broken figure on the card also appears raised up as on a summit, i.e. high like the powers that willfully destroy it. In this way, the figure is honored and folded into the composition. When the universe decided I would have an accident, it was the first of many decisions I would not be required to make for myself. This is from uh, this poem called Queen of Cups. All my poems are called Queen of Cups. <laughs> what thought is turning there within? What plan? Whose hands were those like paper wrapping mine? Answer. There was no particular thought. There were only my hands like paper to wrap yours. They are still my hands, my square nails. At the tip of the gesture, I used to do many things several inches deep into your negative space. And I don't mean I finger you. I try to decide if I like it. I don't decide. I stay. <clears throat> what is it that you wear that smells is the most intimate of the things you will say in acknowledgement of my empirical body. I will try to be too concise. I will talk about lives as parallel lines which by definition do not intersect, but which appear identical, which as in cross-hatching may appear less as individual lines and more as an area of solid shadow on the grayscale. Bearing some comparison to a room ringed with a feathered black band made by thousands of people indicating their height. I can say, <clears throat> I desire this or that thing without having formulated a design <clears throat> to fulfill it, without even having had the fully grammatical thought, which is the statement of the desire that, <clears throat> that is, when I say I desire, its actuality has already been known to me in ways that are not words. The statement of the desire may, however, focus the feeling, both for myself and the other, given that I speak or write it for her, as versus saying it silently to myself in repetition, such as when I am trying to feel good with acute sensations at the core of my body, and I think only the one thought, I feel good, I feel good, and banish the others until I convince my body. I see how far my thought can go away from my body while at the same time serving the good feeling like they recommend visualizing a sexual fantasy in the instructions, which is fine except that my narratives are not linear, so do not guarantee results and occasionally defer them. The deferral in time skews fast or slow depending on how easily the pleasure comes, if it is even within range and to what extent I feel the feeling and do not think it. Yet stating the feeling is effective, although it is words, because it approximates the center and eternal present, which can attain depth and dimensionality, and thus surpass pointing to things at assorted distances. I need some new poems now. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I have a problem with titles, so they don't, I have some titles for these, but they're kind of, they're, they're pretty cheesy, so I'm not going to tell you the titles. <laughs> glow and dying, definitely. Glow, dying, indefinitely. In dying, definitely glow. Or the glitter pours light instantly away. Cascade from my body sounds like metal. In corners like I don't need it anymore. Surprised. I didn't know it wasn't part of me, that shimmer you saw when you approached. Now from the right, now the left, now look at these two boats in the same picture plane from every angle. You stored time, you canceled it, you held it higher, that that living shimmer could tip and pour off the top, undying, undressing, undeserving. All day long you begin to think there is no end to the shimmer that keeps spilling, it's, that keeps spilling so cold it's hot. 
as your color grades down, your sheen is bearing over. Aren't you well, expendable superabundance of silver, bile for your trouble? Baby born with a sign, a mark that flared open. While you tuned your ears to their voice, you meant to write something someone could understand, where the pentip froze instead and bled a shape condensed from breathing. Mm. Mistaken for an abyss. Uh, oh, this is a poem that I wrote. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I dictated text messages to myself while driving in the Southwest. So this, this is, okay. uh, and if instead, <clears throat> and if instead you loved what loves you, music softens, music ripples round your body, tender grip, green water, impossible minuscule finery. Impossible appearance, impossible tendril body, infant fingernail, infant fingernail. Take care, you do not require, you do not recoil. You do not crush, you care to determine, to awaken to care. Care not to crush, care to awaken. Small straw full of water, small honey sucker, suck her honeysuckle. Tube full of honey, shades of amber degrees of consistencies of stickiness of sap, 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 suck, or sucker, 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 to sucker, sip on sap, to save her, save her, s snap back sap, back to sucker. Then if instead of straightening, you soften too, you cup, you spoon, let it rest, let it curl, let it baby, baby up. If you suck, you suck to multiply it. You see it, multiply it, grow wider. If you clutch it, clutch it close, it's skin, is thin, it needs you to. See which hooks and which latches, unbearable likenesses, bear up, undertake, whelm across and bear around her. And if you soften, how you will feel, how will you feel, will you feel how soft, mesh of breath. Body had been inside, and then your two solids, in skins and scanned, and skinned, bump up, right up, sit up, Pony, up pony, on a stride, you, a stride, a stride, a stride easter idea, a stride easter, north easter, hurric hurricane, hurricane, hur hurricane, hurricane, aster, flower, aster, aster, flower, peri wrinkles, asked her, does anybody need me? Does any baby need me? Stay and rest, stay and wrap up, ride up, get somebody who wants to fill you. There isn't any place, none better than here. Do you like poetry, Perry? Wrinkles neath your eyes betray you are a lover, and blue is our color. Blue bower, I consent. Do not be ashamed. I have decided to take all of you, all that you offer me. I accept, accept nothing. I expect something, give me something to eat. Like the landscape recalled your overtures, bellowed, breaking. I believe you. I stand before you, transparent hold. It's a pleasant walk. It goes long ways, so horizon, so lay flat, coffin full, my favorite things. Um, I wasn't paying attention to the time. How much time do you have to keep reading? Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Uh, I learn I learn poker. I'm given stacks of change. It isn't mine. I leave tomorrow. I'd rather participate. I want to pretend. I throw in, I throw in, I throw it all away. What didn't matter, what they gave to me, I played to blow them away. Put on a price, you can't put a price on. The wildest dreams, would they remember me? Were my feelings real? I'll raise you, because I may as well. Tell me how I am doing, what I am doing. You know I have nothing. How do I look? Please give me a number. I ask for three cards. I return to the place that I live. Call everyone I know in succession. Okay. I think about Mars. I think about Mercury. The moon would know and the sun goes without saying. 
I say I'm here because I have form. I have feelings. Fortune tells me it's natural. It's not God, it's not one or two. It's always already broken. It breaks, I shatter. Each day I flip it around. It breaks, I shatter. Each day I flip it around. Sorry. See what shows where I'm not, where I wasn't. Splinters all down me, my blood changes direction. Again, the Ten of Swords. Bleed out on the ground again. Start another time. On a Wednesday, I travel bringing messages to my friends. Keep still, ears fizz, hope not to have thoughts. Behind me is my go-to. By love, I do not mean collapse. Fortune shows me you are no longer discreet. Fortune shows I arrive where I am is a true place is the beginning of the world and nothing makes sense that people just discovered reason. If I could tell you everything, my God, then I might be free. Each contradiction amounted to a reversal. Free when I wrote every detail. Sorry, I thought I could climb out from this hell. I had the greatest hopes for us all and they were all of our, so our sorrows. Take care, they said when I sought counsel. Worry about something else. Always point your toes to the left. You'll wind all the way down to the middle till the arms of the infinite body beat the same air that cools the wet of your mouth. Then simply pass over, they comforted me, without a shadow of a doubt. <clears throat> okay, this is the last poem. <laughs> okay. Thanks, you guys. This is really fun. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I wanted something I could touch. Not only plastic, I was permeable. What I felt loved me to feel it. What I needed to feel loved to feel me needing it. When the meaning stops like it never started, like some will say, whatever, your story is still inside the house that I made back when I had some time to myself. Like a building, I made it for everyone to last, lean back to move forward. When the signs I staked to show the body where to go, not being read by the body, meant nothing, despite words being there. Once when writing became routine, such was the space known by the body parts moving all together, the worn ground, oiled handles, turnstiles, tipped, rusted, till exhumed. The old signs began again to matter, clutter, clatter, on the rocks, on the out and out, on the brink, the edge, the fringe of the fumes, on the vapor trail. How some people get to play animals, how some salt shakers look like animals that look like people, how some people are treasures, sunshine of my life, <clears throat> my very own. Pick one pastel. Pick one pastel, that will be you, powder blue, even your little face. Gone, gone, totally gone. Totally, completely gone. Thank you. of Renee Gladman often use the term hybrid genre to classify her work, and in many ways it's a fitting description. Formally distinctive as her books are, each demonstrates the sensibility of the poet, the novelist, the contemplative essayist, and the visual artist all at once. In Juice from 2000, for instance, the narrator jars us with poetic or ruminative non sequiturs, as when in the middle of her story she deploys the sentence, Demographics help people in cars. But she isn't letting go of our hand so much as she is gripping it more tightly, showing us the way of things, pointing out adjacent spaces. And while it might seem that the novel is transforming into something else, an essay, a poem, 
it is really becoming self-actualized, more so itself. For the, for the deceptively banal statement gestures towards a peripheral narrative, the people in cars and the shadowy demographers who, from a distance, look after them. It is not a combining of genres or an expansion of language, but a distillation of the latent properties and assumptions of the two. You could say that Gladman treats language itself as a genre. In an interview with Bond Magazine, she says that, quote, language has a dream of itself, and the book passes through the dream. Maybe the best example of this is her book, Prose Architectures, which consists of line drawings that approximate the shape of buildings and cities made of orthographic marks, pseudo-words. And you'll have to read the book to see what I mean. They show us language in the process of becoming expression, becoming image, until we realize that it is language manifesting itself as what it already is. And what it is can't be paraphrased. As Fred Moten puts it, Gladman pushes graphic recitation to and over its edge, not so much into incomprehension, but into an exploration of comprehension stakes and chances. One of the major concerns of Gladman's work is the relationship between space and nothingness, the project of recuperating nothingness from its philosophical abstraction toward an encounter with it as a space we might inhabit. In the same interview with Baum, she says, quote, when I teach poetry, I like to ask my students, where does the poem exist? Is it that thing on the page? Is it the words lingering in our brain, some feeling in the body? Where is it? The nothing that happens when one writes, Danielle is sitting in that chair is incredibly compelling to me. <laughs> Thus, in Wallace Stevens's distinction between the nothing that is not there and nothing that is, Gladman sees a third possibility, the nothing that happens, an event of nothingness. It's a concept that can't be articulated so much as in circles. Gladman describes this problem in her essay collection, Calamities, quote, Poetry comes out of nothing, I said, opening something I would never be able to close. Read the nothing, I shouted after them as they walked out the door. And so in Gladman's work, we learn to accept this opening, to spend time in it. Renee Gladman is the author of 10 books of poetry and prose, including Calamities, which won the 2017 Firecracker Award in Nonfiction. Gladman holds degrees from Vassar College and the New College in California, and currently teaches at Brown University. Her novel, Houses of Rafika, the final installment of the Rafika trilogy, is forthcoming next month. Please join me in welcoming Renee Gladman. Mutilated quartz. I most decidedly do not teach at Brown University. <laughs> Did you read Calamities? Thank you for that very beautiful uh, introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here tonight. It's really great um, to see you and to read to you and to read with Nicole um, so many. Um, old friends in the room and hopefully new friends. Um, I'm going to, I feel like I have a few identities now. Um, today's identity, I just want to read you a story um, from uh, Houses of Ravika, which just, which just came out, uh, I think maybe a week ago. And uh, so this is my first time reading from it. Uh, can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay, I just, good. And I'm going to actually get even louder once I start. Um, and I, my publisher, I, I feel like, did a really great thing where they, the caption on the back of the book actually makes it seem like it has events and, um, <laughs> and action. So I just wanted, I want to read the back as it would actually set up what's going to happen <laughs> um, or what's not going to happen. Um, Ravika's comptroller, author of Regulating the Book of Regulations, seems to have lost a house. It is not where it's supposed to be, though an invisible house on the far side of town, which corresponds to the missing house, 
remains appropriately invisible. Inside the invisible house, a nameless Rebekian considers how she came to the life she's living and invis investigates the deep history of Ravika. Um, so there are two parts of the book, and the first part is, um, is where all the action happens. And I'm going to read from the second part because um, I, I do think inaction is kind of more interesting. Um, so I'm reading part two. Um, it's really nothing you need to know. I'm going to say a bunch of words. <laughs> Some of which are Rubikian. Um, I'll say the word um, paray, and we'll sometimes mispronounce it as paray. Uh, which is just the, the term that uh, signifies the, all the kind of physical gestures and gymnastics that people have to do in order to speak clearly in Ravika. So you can't just say your words, you have to perform various things with the body. Um, so at some point my, my narrator is interested in talking about that. Um, and I really think that's all you need to know. There's a, um, the, there is a, the mystery of the book is that house number 96 should be in the school book on this particular street, which I can't remember right now. Um, and it's not, and we don't know why. But number 32, which is its invisible companion, is not there appropriately, although the question remains, if the house that is supposed to be there is not there, we don't really know if the house that isn't there is actually there appropriately. <laughs> but, but as luck would have it, um, <laughs> we have a narrator who lives in the invisible house um, who's going to give us a little bit of information about space and nothing. Else. So that's a perfect setup. Thank you. Number 32, I'm going to take my glasses off. That means I can't see you, but I'm going to pretend that I can. <laughs> I'm making eye contact, so. <laughs> Number 32, I live here and have done so for at least a decade and have furnished brightly the spacious top floor flat of seven rooms, this wallless, invisible flat, and in all that time I've gotten up made coffee, dressed, and walked out the door. To leave an invisible structure is just as difficult as returning to one. I'd like to try and explain what it's like. First, how you leave, and then how you return. Probably before all of that, I should describe the events that led to my occupying 32 Ravash Binder, events belonging to an even larger system of events and weather that are so in situ it's hard to gather them. But I do know that if I'm to tell a story about how I live, I'm also to tell about work and sex and how the city breathes. And this requires me to back all the way up to the barbarous <coughs> wall, which long ago used to divide the upper and lower parts of the city on the east side, or even back further up to the emergence of the old city unfolding literally beneath this one born both of it and before it, and the new laws of motion it introduced into the science of the land, something always changing beneath you changes your chemistry, historians now say. No, perhaps I should begin by saying what it means to see or how measurements occur in time, because first you have to let go of the notion that sights enter the eyes, or merely the eyes. I like to travel far out of the city center stand in some improbable place and describe the things obstructed from my view. I try to see them even though they are behind me or are blocked by the buildings of Seelix and Tali, cast in shadows by the trees of Top Seat and Tala. You see something by calling its name and doing a pun view with the body. I go to the dirtiest part of the city, the old dilapidated box, and I dream of the Hafshas. I see the grasses and tij. I stand against the north wall of the National Library and press my face into the glued concrete at its, of its facade, and I write a letter about what people are reading inside. I send the letter to the building and try to erase it from my mind. 
I don't read. I try to tell myself books don't exist. I'm lying in the woods that run along the A5 with my face against the moist ground, reading the last book. Some, hum some hum extends from the city, and the walls of every home creep a single electrical bend that divides time. Only a third of the residents bear a record of the break. Only half of that third had actually heard it. Only a third of that half of the third reflected on it. And just a few of these tired, still deeply dreaming souls, a sixteenth of a third of that half of a third, connect this minuscule eruption to those from previous nights and previous residences. I don't see anything in the ground of the forest, but I hear pages turning in the book. The book, these creeks in the walls of houses, the hum of the city, the lines in the asphalt, have backed me up to the forest, my face against the ground. I was trying to tell you what it means to see a city that itself sees, that looks out of its structure towards some imagined place, some activating force. We have a whole science that says the buildings of Ravika are on the move, the houses, the buildings. And although the science doesn't say it's because the houses see that they move, it's clear that they move because they see. Otherwise, we wouldn't be studying the migration of buildings, but rather the behavior of some further exterior force. For example, if experts believed the migrations were due to wind or erosion, then we'd be looking more deeply at the properties of wind, the effects of erosion. And perhaps some group is studying one or the other of those things, because the ball of winds are strong and erosion occurs wherever there is ground. But when it comes to what sets a house in motion, science seems to look primarily at the subjectivity of houses, not going so far as to say that they have psychology, but definitely allowing for instinct or bewilderment. Houses have creaked for a long time. Long before the first house got up and walked off, the walls of houses creaked, and not just in Robica. Nearly every ghostly tale has something that creaks. Wouldn't it be logical to argue this as the first evidence of building seeing? As I said earlier, seeing does not extend foremost from the eyes. I get my face dirty in the forest, but I don't come here when it rains. I don't want any trouble with drowning or suffocating. I want to lie down and see what's happening on my street. Understanding what's happening in the houses that surround my house, noting the schedules people keep, which neighbors commingle, which keep to themselves, what books they read, whether or not they work, what the clocks on their walls say, helps me to define my own house, to give it shape, to know how to enter it today. <clears throat> A calamity! <laughs> <laughs> to be clear though, 32 Bravash Binder is not in motion. That is not one of its characteristics. It's not off somewhere touring the city or the outskirts wreaking havoc on stationary structures. Despite its invisibility, it is not a mystery. It doesn't go on Bruns' list. People are not talking about it behind closed doors. Number 32 bears the condition of many other houses in Ravika. It exists on a degree and parallel to some other house, usually on the opposite side of the city. And for reasons laid out in the Book of Regulations, oblique to a layman like me, the other house relies on the invisibility of these houses in order to exist. But how do you know the place where you live is invisible? And how did you come to live there? It's not only visitors from faraway countries who ask me these questions. Some of my friends from the oldest families in Ravka grow flustered when it comes to the question of Ra's houses, many setting themselves up in heavier homes, granite walls, deep foundations, hoping to stay grounded. However, I would argue, for any one house to be in motion, every other house must be as well. It would be different were this open country where miles separated one living structure from another. In that scenario, houses could do whatever they wanted probably for centuries. 
before any other house knew it, sorry, before any other house knew about it. And that would be an entirely different science we'd be crafting, having no need to take propinquity into account. However, except for the forest, the grasses, and the outskirts, this is a densely built city. Even bodies alter environments when they move through them. And for a long time, we seemed to understand how to read these changes. We knew how to adjust our thinking when we came upon a protest at the city center, a crowd of bodies standing in a new formation, or bodies in a moving, furious cluster pushing toward a gate or door, a stage. There is a pariah for throngs. There is a pariah for one body sprinting through the train station a pariah for an excited family running up or down steps toward a park or carnival, a pariah for a couple in a fight where one of the two storms away or where the both storm away but in opposite directions, a pariah for when they make up and embrace and stay still for an hour, though stillness is another kind of movement. It affects the ground even if not the wind. Most Rubikians are excited when the environment changes the more awkward the situation one is observing, the more elaborate is the response. But also the more subtle is its performance, yet the more public. Many people who seem to be in motion are most likely just in the middle of a response to something else. It's hard to know. Somehow the elders didn't account for this. We exist in a society of complex gestures, all running along their own time. We are all interrupting witnessing, performing simultaneously. And this was much easier to accept and discern when it was believed that all of our movement happened upon an unmoving ground, when it was believed that the ground itself was a dense impaction of dirt and sediment, when we didn't think about the ground. Now as I move along the streets of Wabaka, I think how odd it must have been to have this sort of geographic numbness I'm talking about where your sense of the planet is on one hand a picture of the green and blue sphere rotating in a lonely, vast darkness, and on the other hand, that indisputable, flat, one-dimensional ground upon which we built our houses or took off in our planes. We have always acted as if we understood the space between the ground and the sky, because this is primarily where we place our bodies. This was our living space where we could most understand breath and language and light and contour. Someone at some point in our history said it was safe to walk across the ground, to walk without thinking about the ground. We were free to study the sky, to figure out how to build an empty space. Birds were our mentors. We laughed at things that burrowed below ground. We left them to the dark. Our understanding of space became implicit, complex, ornate, but always extending from the body which began at our feet or at our crown and returned to the body. We would have sworn the environment was complete, not quite closed or sealed, but unchanging enough that, that we all had access to the pattern. We shared memory, language, and the depths of our homes. We shared our bodies. We touched our, we touched our breasts to one another. We pulled our limbs through. We drank each other's fluids. Living comprised all these movements, all these collectivities, and while it seemed to be transporting, transpiring on top of a silent, crystallized ground among glued down crops, you could drop your books while you were running for the bus, and I could jump back twice, then slowly forward in a somersault and grab a leaf from a tree and a rock from my pocket, hand you the book you neglected to retrieve, the one under the tire of the parked car. And if we walked away from the scene without exchanging names or other means of contact, it would have seemed strange but not conspiratorial. I would have made a small notation later in my notebook, and that would have been the day. But the ground opened or lifted, and an ancient city began to carve itself beneath us, talking to our structures, setting them in motion, a city most of us can't reach. I have never seen the door which awaits the traveler many kilometers on the ground, nor have I found the vaunted gate at the bottom of the stairs inside Shadow of Quartz Park. I have read about these portals in Amini novels. I've seen them drawn and mapped out and passed around at Photographer's Cafe. 
But I don't know whether these stories and maps actually lead to the ancient city or whether they may merely take one along the elaborate roads and sentences of fiction. <clears throat> I can only take so much of the forest floor at this time of year. It's cold out so the ground and walls of structures take on a brittle quality. You can learn from brittle, but you can't see clearly through it. You can't read it, and there is not much to eat. When it's cold and the light is low in the forest, there are many more voices, and I have to concentrate deeply so to discern my voice from the others, even though my voice emits from my body, and I should be able to feel this aspiration occurring. However, I don't feel it because of how long the branches hang, how low the branches hang, and because my body is spread throughout the forest, the narrow paths carry the pieces the way light cuts through space. Everything is splintered, everything is an echo. Your movements begin to repeat those of invisible animals scurrying through the thick. I avoid the thick because, but because I am participating in the environment, my body takes on quality of animals in the thick. I walk mindful of the small stone house nestled in the heart of these woods. The house watches me as I approach and make detours to bypass it. All of us forest animals work diligently to make space and leave space for one another. I am here to see. I know many of the other animals are here because they were born here. They spend the day in search of food. When it's cold, they sleep and dig themselves into the ground. They make a pile of leaves and sticks and feathers. I think this is what we're hearing, the making of piles. But I don't know why the house is here, and I especially don't want to see what it sees. To be clear, unlike the animals in the stone house of this forest, I don't live here. I inhabit 32 Brahma Spinder, which is a house situated in Seat Mahai, receiving the light of Seat Sahai, gazing into the attic of Seat Sahim. And this is a house in direct parallel to another house on the west side of the city. My house exists and has walls, but is also invisible. I wanted to tell you how I came to live here, so I went out to the outskirts in order to see. I wanted to make clear what it meant by the word invisible, what is meant when someone says being unseen does not make you a ghost, particularly in your house. It is also important to understand who would be saying this and why and to whom the person would be brave enough to speak. Not that there is a government conspiracy to defend myself against, there is little danger in that. I mean, there might be a government conspiracy, but there is nothing the elders could concoct that would stand up to this conspiracy of architecture, though the architects pretend to be just as confounded as everyone else that the buildings move and that a city grows beneath us, grows without itself needing to be constructed, grows if it's, it's a memory returning to a body intact and age. I wanted to be an opera singer. I wanted to sing in the great cathedrals of Poland. Later I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to draw lines across a large surface, then scratch away those lines, then would, would redraw them, then scratch them away again and do this with my eyes closed or in low northern light until someone said, time's up, the opening is tomorrow. I wanted to sing and I wanted to draw, so I moved to Seat Mahai as every other creative person does. You go there or you go to Seat Mahai, to Sahai if you're looking to practice art at the level of science, if you want to be an architect, for example, or a photographer. I wanted to draw. I wanted to carve lines with my voice. I wanted to gather all the breath in my body and bifurcate an audience. When I entered Seat Mahai at the age of 17, it was as if crossing into another country. I grew up not far from this neighborhood. In fact, I visited often as a kid. So it was not as though I didn't know where I was. I knew the cafes. I knew the modern museum. My parents had longtime friends that lived at 1821 Philosopher next to one of the best bookstores in the city. Seat Mahai was not unknown to me, yet when I made my crossing in company of my childhood friend, Serene Kuchek, when I passed through the fog of the Fallen River River Bridge and existed and exited into the bright yellow of Mahai, I felt as though I surfaced in an unknown land. 
I'm trying to tell you why. The buildings were already in motion at this point. You had not yet begun studying geoscography as a subject in school, but every reading person was aware of it, rather every active person. Anyone moving about outside, even if it was just to buy a loaf of bread or refill the olive oil, even if it was just to collect leaves for pressing, would soon enough realize herself on some living ground. You weren't in an action movie. The street didn't rise up and fling itself crashing down upon other streets, destroying buildings and homes, with you clutching for life to some rebar hanging over a void. Time pulled the event apart. The earth moving, the buildings putting themselves in transit was like the slowing down of everything. The days were a year long. Time was the machination of the earth turning and the buildings of Robica trying to do something that no other country was reported to have done. The city was a novel in progress, and everyone knew this. We spoke jokingly of ourselves as novellians. The banter gave us space. As long as the change was creative, was about some thinking mind going after new shapes, we reasoned our bodies were safe. The city wouldn't try to destroy our bodies. It needed us. It needed our habitation. It was amazing to imagine your city was a novel, and that for you to walk around within it meant that you were in language, you were in a thinking text. Pages were walls that enclosed you. The ground was the floor of the book, the horizon of the sentence. And all you were doing was walking up hills, going for coffee, hanging close to dry. We were inside a living structure, ourselves living, and went on this way for a long time. Long before I was born, the Novellians were weaving tales about the extended night, where houses stood up and walked off, and radiant dawn spent combing through neighborhoods. Have you seen the Volta? Is the Galilee dawn and seat soon tally this morning? The elders added an hour to the workday, so I was born into this wandering, although it didn't become my own until I was an adult. Growing up, I saw the city as a strange, unknown body that seemed to be in conversation with its inhabitants and seemed to believe direct communication was possible. We didn't understand what it wanted to say, so when we moved around looking for our lost sites or we built new sites and vacated spaces, the city took this as a response. We'd walk a new way to work or coffee or to dinner with a friend, and by the next morning the city would have responded, would have moved something. And I say moved to encapsulate all kinds of change. I'm saying the city responded, the city communicated, but these are not the right words. We tried to go on with our living in spite of everything changing around us. We tried to complete the simple task, just get up, go to work, run along the river, attending a reading, go to D's number T's opening, have a drink with someone, maybe bring her home, go to sleep, wake again. We tried to make these motions of living automatic, inherent to time, thus occurring regardless of what the buildings did or, where, or, or of where we were with the massively slow shifting of our infrastructure. This was not a response, but the buildings read it as such. The buildings expected something else. If I've got the story right, and if those who handed the story down to me got it right, the story which feels a little flimsy, like it fell out of a book or was dug out of the ground. If we were to allow this to be the true story of what happened when the ground opened and the city beneath us grew and the buildings of the above city began to stand up and stretch and move around, the story said our ancestors moved about in a wind with their ears plugged, and music was at its most engaging then. They walked and music carried them and everything else, the draining waters, the quiet war, structures migrating, with light, light flickering on the wall, the disco's strobe light. You didn't have to understand the light, just move to it, just keep a rhythm that someone else could match use the rhythm to build a language and keep from the core of that language anything the language couldn't understand. This is the speaking language I'm talking about, which is radically different from the written one. Just a couple more pages. So when I made my crossing into Seat Lahai those many years ago, I was actually accustomed to the buildings, 
accustomed to the story of their changing and had had some bodily experience of their changing as well. Although not directly, it was more through someone else's body that I could touch the details. Nevertheless, when I crossed, it was as if an aspect of the neighborhood split off at once, not disappearing as you might hope or expect, leaving you with the familiar, perhaps a story of some strange sensation of space hovering or eluded or shut away. Rather, the seat Mahai I had known was the one that fled, and what stayed behind seemed newer than I was. It was the architecture of the buildings. It was the facade of the buildings, their windows, some flickering of light on the glass, some flickering of light above the glass, above the houses that drew my attention. I couldn't put my finger on it, but immediately upon stepping onto Legastrade Street from the bridge, I saw reflections of light where light shouldn't be, where it couldn't be because there was no wall, no surface there to send the light back toward the sun. The light should have gone through, hit the houses on Bay Spitter. Instead, the light appeared as a presence floating above some of the buildings, above many of the buildings I passed as I tried to find my new home. The light didn't feel like a haunting. It didn't remind me of people. Neither was it reminiscent of place. If anything, it was as if the clouds had fallen from the sky. Clouds shot through with light, broke up by some enormity, something electric and powerful. I had never seen these floating light bodies anywhere in Robert before, and it wasn't easy explaining what I saw to Serene. As I said, she'd made her crossing the previous year, and the Mahai she knew before she crossed the bridge remained. This was a story you might read in a Luce Wajamini novel, where someone is searching for the composers, that brigade of walkers who set out before evening, who set out before everyone else does, carving lines into the ground, the roads of our future maps, but a person searches them out to reveal a mistake having been made, a whole country miss, a hidden geography. Yet the seeker can't find the composer, so the composers go on mapping already mapped terrain, and in the space of the novel, I mean his masterpiece in a lot we dark, never encounter that undiscovered country, which we are encouraged to believe is old Robica and Mason. I was walking along the street, though, and this was supposed to be reality. People say you can never be quite certain that you're not in a novel, and if, while you are in this uncertain place, something strange happens, you should begin your own novel. I went to Mahai to draw and to sing. I was not invested in description. I cared about time as duration, all the breath I could get in a bar. But I was indifferent to its increments. Of course, I knew there was A and B, and it was impossible not to simply follow these rules as you made your life as a young artist, as anything, in fact. The streets made us orderly, the sun did, even clouds. Our hunger put us in time, our desire for sex, wanting to know what was down that alley. And you knew it was all broken up into steps and micro events. But in the first days, my wandering was interrupted by a grouping of light bodies that seemed to be making scaffolding in the sky, in the space between the tops of buildings and sky, above the roofs of houses. And I studied closely to see whether other people were aware of the silent construction. It was hard to tell. I performed the wandering parai when I was in the vicinity of these architectures. Pastor Vise would suggest I read Patola's I Thought of Architecture, which I had read many times and knew many passages by heart as almost everyone else did. It was because I was performing the wandering cry without the appropriate speaking words that my gestures came across as entreaty, as if to demand, help me see better or live better. And since I was standing as close to the outer walls of buildings, people assumed I was speaking in reference to them, the buildings. I have to stop because this goes on. Um, thank you. <laughs> Renee, thank you, Nicole. Um, thanks to the microphone for behaving better at the EP. 
really regressed. Um, we'll have to get the department techie to fix whatever is wrong with it. Um, please hang out, talk to Renee and Nicole for a bit if you want. Um, take a look at uh, the two of Renee's books that are here. Um, the book Prose Architecture that, or architectures that uh, Dylan Furcall mentioned, um, sold out at Moe's this afternoon, but more copies are on order. Um, Moe's is on Telegraph Avenue, uh, one of the greatest things in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.